and welcome to the On Maths prediction for the OCR GCSE Maths paper Foundation Tier Paper 2. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Chris Gilpin and welcome to the On Maths prediction for the second OCR GCSE Maths paper. Now this is for the new spec, so this is the 9 to 1. If you're redoing um, the paper, then obviously there's going to be a few topics in this that won't be on your paper. So what is this that we are doing? What's the video about? We can cover a predicted paper. Now I've got the paper one, so I've looked through all the topics that came up and have tried to predict what will come up on paper two. Basically, uh, it won't be those topics and the example of stress it might be. Um, I predict that you know if, if some of the big topics come up, they're not going to come up again. Um, and I just go through the paper. Now, please use this as part of your revision, not solely relying on this, which I know uh, no one is. Um, but this is a quite a good tool just to make sure that you understand the topics that probably will come up. Now, um, this is a video of our prediction we've done on the website on maths.com where you can for free go online and do this paper but the beauty of the website is the numbers keep changing so you will every time you do the paper you're remembering methods and not answers so you can do it as many times as you want and the numbers will be different each time and sometimes the the focus of the question will be slightly different um, if you sign up for free um, it will save your scores you don't need to sign up but if you choose to for free it will save your scores for you so you can do it today and then you can have a go tomorrow and see whether your revision has had an impact so um, on the on math site we have topic busters for every single topic now uh, it's taken over a year to write them but now they're for every single topic um, so if you uh, want to revise estimation then you can just type in estimation and have a go on the topic buster on the site and there's also minute marks which are quick multiple choice uh, questions that have videos on them to say how the right answer was got anyway i'm rambling now so without further ado let's get started okay so if you want to pause the video now and have a go otherwise let's get going so we have james has just received an electric bill below is part of it so his new reading is 3900 and his old reading is 3710 the important part is this price per unit that's how much he gets charged per unit so work out how much James needs to pay for his bill so you only get charged with electric bills for the amount that you've actually used so he started the month off on 3710 and then the little ticker adds one on every unit he uses until at the end of the month he or quarter or whatever this is done over it then goes up to 3900 so we first of all need to work out well how many units did he use so we do 3900 and we take away 3710 this is none calculator so we have to do this without a calculator so 0 take away 0 is going to be 0 now you can't do 0 take away 1 so you're going to have to nick one off that 9 so that 9 turns into an 8 and we carry 1 over so we do 10 take away 1 which is 9 Okay, 8 take away 7 which is 1 and then 3 take away 3 is nothing so he's used 190 units next thing we've got to do is work out well okay he's used 190 units how much money is that well, it's 9 pence a unit so I could do this a number of different ways but I'm going to use multiplication grid why not okay, and we'll need 3 so we're going to do 9 because that's the price per unit times 190 and that's just 0 so we can we don't have to worry about that last box because 0 times 9 is 0 so 9 times 9 is 81 so 9 times 90 is 100, uh, 810. 9 times 100 is 900. Okay, and then we need to add those together. So 900 plus 810. 
is going to be 9 plus 8 is 17. So that's uh, 1,710 pence. So in pounds, the decimal point is going to go between the 7 and the 1. So it's going to be 17 pounds and 10 pence. Thank you very much. The easiest way to order decimals is just to put yourself a few columns down the page. And hopefully I'm going to try and get enough columns. I always end up with not enough. So if I put some extra ones in, that should suffice. And just literally put the numbers in. So 14.828. And make sure the point, decimal points are lined up. So 8.60 is going to be like this and I'm going to put an extra zero in to make them all the same length it doesn't change the number at all so 14.86 I'm going to put zero in there 14.820 and then 14.7 now we're starting with the smallest so I'm looking for the smallest one first well, the smallest one's leaping out because if I just look at this column, there's only one number that has a zero there. All the rest of them have one. So the 8.60, and I have to put the zero because that's how it's said in the question, is definitely the smallest. So we can cross that out. That's definitely the smallest. All the other ones are tied. They're all one in that column. So we move over to the left, the next column, sorry, the next one to the right. So 4444, four, 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 they're all tied. So I keep moving along. Okay, though there's a clear loser in this one. There's a clear one that's the smallest in this one. The bottom one, 14.7. So that's definitely the next smallest. So I can cross that one out. All the other three have tied because they're all eight. So I move on to the next column. Now, looking at this, there's two twos and a six. Now that six is definitely the biggest number. So I could fill that in as the biggest number. And we've just got to work out what the smaller of these remaining two are. Well, let's move on a column. And you can see here that 14.82 is the small, smallest or smaller of the two. And so that leaves the 14.828 in that position. Now always just double check the five numbers you've listed are the same as um, in the question. That's the same, 18.60, that's the same, 14.86, that's the same, 14.82 uh, is the same, and 14.7 is the same. You sometimes lose a mark if you haven't written exactly the same number. Same goes for when there's fractions and decimals. You've got to write down the number that it showed in the question. first thing to look at with a pictogram, which this is, um, is the key. Now the key tells us what each picture represents. So if you have a look at the key here, it says each circle represents eight DVDs. Now that's the complete circle. So it says what day are the most DVDs sold, Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday? Well, or you can always just look at which has the most shapes. Now, Tuesday has two, Wednesday has one and a half, but Monday has over two, two and three quarters. So it's definitely going to be Monday, because it's got the most circles. Now, how many DVDs were sold on Tuesday? Well, if each circle represents eight, there's eight there, and there's eight there. So we just need to add the eights together, which makes 16. So 16 DVDs were sold on Tuesday says how many DVDs were sold on Monday? Well, you've got the 8 there and you've got the 8 there. Now we've got a bit of a problem here because it's not a complete 8. So we need to figure out how much each quarter is worth. Well, what do you times by 4 to get to 8? Well, 2. Let's check to see if that works. So we've got 2 there, 2 there, 2 there, and an extra 2, which is actually missing on that one, would make 8. So that's, that would work perfectly. So to find out a quarter of it, we just divide it by 4, which gives us 2. So we've got the 8, because we've got two complete circles, 
And then we've got those three twos, so we've got another six. So we just need to add on six to the 16. So 16 plus six is going to be 22. So that's going to be 22. Okay, let's have a look at the next question. On Thursday, 20 DVDs were sold. Show this information on a pictogram. So let's have a think how many circles that will be. So if I've put one circle down, that's eight. Well, we've still got enough left over. If I put another full circle down, that's 16. Now 16, let's try another one. Let's put another full circle down and that gives us 24. So that would be too much. So we're going to have to go into those quarters. So we've got 16. How many more twos do we need? So 16, that would give us 18. And that would give us 20. So we need two whole circles and then two quarters. So if I shade in, uh, if I draw then shade in, two whole circles. And then we've got two quarters left over, which is just a half. Let's just check that. What's half of eight? That would be four. And what's eight plus eight plus four? That gives us 20. So we know the answer is correct. Okay, if you want to pause the video, please do so now. Otherwise, we'll zoom in and have a go at this question. So, let's zoom in. Okay, uh, whenever you're working out a fraction or percentage of a shape, first thing you've got to do is realize how much equal chunks have you got. So we've got one, two, three, four equal chunks. So the bottom of a fraction is going to be four. And then the next question you've got to ask is, how many are shaded or how many are we interested in? So we're interested in one, two of those. So it's going to be two over four as a fraction, which if I halve top and bottom, I get one over two. Next question is, well, what is that as, as a percentage? Because the question asks for a percentage. Well, I know that half is 50%. A whole is 100%. Remember, if you say you're 100% certain of something, it means you're absolutely certain. So therefore, if you're half certain, you're half of 100, which is 50%. So let's do the next question. It says, what fraction of the shape is shaded? So there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 equal chunks. So I know the bottom of the fraction will be 8. And the next question I'm going to answer is, how many are we interested in? How many are shaded? 1, 2, 3. So 3 are shaded. So it's going to be 3 over 8. 3 out of the 8 chunks. And I can't simplify that. 3 over 8. Alright, the next question is shade in 1 fifth. Now this is quite tricky because we have uh, 10 squares in total. But if we think about it, we actually have 5 of these sort of, say, larger square, uh, well, rectangles, I suppose, aren't they? So all I need to do is shade in one of those. Now don't spend forever trying to get the perfect shading. Something like this, although it looks rubbish, will still give you the mark. Okay, As long as you clearly identify which squares you want to shade. A different way of working that out is if you imagine 1 over 5, if you double top and bottom, it will become 2 over 10. So it's 2 of the squ 10 squares that we need to shade which are those. It doesn't matter which squares we chose to shade. Okay, on to the last question. We have five fractions there. We've got 4 over 10, 2 over 8, 5 over 20, 5 over 25, and 4 over 10. And we're we'll asked, right, which ones of those, which two of those are equivalent, are the same as 1 over 4? So, first thing I'd do to, write, to answer this question is just figure out what is equivalent to a quarter. So let's times top and bottom by 2, and I get 2 over 8, which is actually this one here. So I know that 2 over 8 is equivalent to a quarter. Then I'm going to times top and bottom of 1 and 4, so 1 over 4, by 3. So it becomes 3 over 12. Let's have a look. There's no 3 over 12s there. So let's keep going. Let's times top and bottom of a quarter by 4. So it becomes 4 
over 16. Let's check. Well, there's a 4 over 10. There's a couple of 4 over 10s for some reason, uh, but there's no 4 over 16. Okay, let's times top 1 by 5. So it becomes 5 over 20. And there we go. We've got a 5 over 20. So it's 2 over 8 and 5 over 20. For this question, we need to understand the difference between multiples and factors. Multiples are just a numbers times table. So the multiples of 5 will be 5, 10, 15, 20, etc, etc. Now every number in the 5 times table ends in 0 or 5. So looking at the list of numbers we've got here, there's only one that ends in a 5 or a 0, which is 10. So 10 is a multiple of 5. Now factors go the other way. A factor of a number means that the number, so 24, is in another numbers times table. So 24, and the easiest way to find the factors of 24 is you start off with 1 and 24, because 1 times 24 is 24. Then you go 2 times, well, 12, 3 times, 3 times 8, uh, 4 times, and you think how many 4s? 6. 5 times, well, that doesn't work. Six times we've already got. So those eight numbers are the factors of 24. Then I look at the list. Well, already there's a 24 there. Is there any other ones I could have written? I don't see any other ones. So 24 is my answer there. Two prime numbers. Now, prime numbers mean they only have two factors. One and themselves. Okay, that's a prime number. If there's any more factors, it's not a prime number. So, let's go through the list. 10 is in the 5 times table, which we identified in question A, so that's not a prime number. 24, well, we've listed out 6 other factors of 24, so that's not in it. Uh, 18 is 3 times 6, so that's not going to be it. 17, I don't think of any times tables that 17 is in, so I'm going to say 17 is a prime number, which it is. And 19, well, I can't think of any times tables 19 is in, so I think that's a prime number. Let's go through the rest to make sure. So 16 is 2 and 8, so that's not a prime number. And any even number apart from 2 is not going to be a prime number. 2 is the only even prime number. 27 looks like it might be, but actually 3 times 9 is 27, so it's definitely not. And 28 is another even number. So it looks like we found the two prime numbers. To answer this question, first of all, we need to know what the gradient is. So what you do is you pick two points that you know the coordinates of, which is that one and that one I'm going to pick. works with any of them. And we work out how much up and how much across it's gone. Well, it's gone one up, but I'm going to do this in pence. So I'm going to say it's gone 100 pence up, and it's gone 10 uh, miles across. So to work out the gradient, we're going to do um, the change in y, so how much it's gone up, over how much it's gone across. Now, some students have that the wrong way around because coordinates work the other way around. You go along the corridor and up the stairs. With gradients, how far you go up or down over how much you've gone right. So that's going to be 10. Now, it says give an interpretation, so we haven't finished answering the question. What does that mean? Well. It means for every one mile that we've gone, it's going to cost 10 pence. Now remember, I converted this into pence, so instead of in pounds, it's going to be pence. So the gradient is the cost per mile. And I'm going to put in brackets 10p. Now, it could be that just writing the cost per mile for this question would give you the mark, but if you actually write the gradient as well, then you definitely get the mark, and sometimes it will ask you for the gradient and then ask you to interpret it. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise, let's get started. So the first thing to do with these questions is make them top-heavy. The way we do that is if you look at four and a third, we times the four by the bottom and add it to the top. So we're going to times 4 by 3 to get 12 and add it to the top. So that gives us 13 
and the bottom stays the same over 3 and then we go times the 2 by the 4 and add it to the top so 4 times 2 is going to be 8 added to the top is going to be 9 over 4 now what we're going to do is we're going to times both sides here by the bottom of the other fraction and we're going to times both sides here by the bottom of the other fraction so 13 times 4 well, I know 10 times 4 is 40 3 times 4 is 12 so it's going to be 52 over and 3 times 4 is 12 then I'm going to times 9 by 3 so that will be 27 and 3 times 4 which is 12 and then all you need to do is take away the tops so 52 take away 27 which is 25 and the bottom stays the same 12 the last thing we've got to do is work out how many 12s there are in 25 well, I know 2 times 12 is 24 so that's going to be 2 whole ones and how many remainders well if 2 times 12 is 24 that's going to be 1 remainder so the answer is going to be 2 and 1 12 so we're going to do the same on the next one so we're going to do the 4 times the 3 add to the top 3 times the 4 add to the top so that's going to be 13 over 3 and this next one's going to be 13 over 4. Now the rule with division is a same change flip. We keep the first fraction the same, we change the divide sign and we flip the second one. And some of the teachers call this KFC, keep, flip, change. So we're going to keep that or keep that 13 over 3 the same. We change that divide sign to a times and we're going to flip that second fraction so 13 over 4 becomes 4 over 13. Then I times the tops so 4 times 10 is 40, 3 times 4 is 12 so it's going to be 52 and times the bottoms so that's going to be 39. So I've got to work out how many 39s go into 52. Well I know 2 times 39 is going to be way more than 52. So it's going to be one whole one. And then I've got to work out what 52 take away 39 is going to be. And that's going to be 13 over 39. Now 13 over 39, if I divide top and bottom by 3, uh, sorry, by 13, I get 1 over 3. So that's 1 and a third. So we are given function machines for this question and it says uh, what is the output when the input's 24? So the input's 24 and the first thing that's going to happen to it is it's going to divide by 2 so we're going to halve it. So that's going to make it 12. Then it says we're going to add 6. So when we add 6 to 12 we get 18. So the output is 18. Next question says below is a different number machine. It says when the input is 20 the output is 56. So let's follow through on the input. So the input's 20, we go take away 6, so that's going to give us 14. Now we've got to then think, right, how do I get from 14 to 56? Now, as it stands, there are multiple ways of doing this. If you do this on onmaths.com, it has a drop down box and it only lets you select one of the options. So you can add a number to 14 to get to 56, and for this question that would be full marks, that would be absolutely fine. Or you can times it by 4, and times by 4 is the one I'm going to go for. So I'm going to complete the number machine by saying times 4. Okay, if you want to pause the video now and have a go, otherwise let's get started. Now with these questions I always like to put a big line down the page to show the examiner what I'm doing. I'm going to do shop A over here and I'm going to do shop B over here. Okay, so shop A says there's th so rulers and price. So there are three rulers for £1.50. 
So to get to 30 rulers, I times it by 10, so that's going to be 15 pounds. So 30 rulers of 15 pounds. Okay, let's do shop B. Rulers and price. So five rulers is two pounds. Now to get from two to 30, I need to times by six. So I'm gonna times the two by six. That gives me 12 pounds. So it says, what is the cheapest price for 30 rulers? The cheapest price is 12 pounds at shop B. So the first thing to look at in this question is how many sides has the spinner got? So we've got one, two, three, four equally sized, equally spaced out sides of that spinner. So any one of those um, colors is going to be a quarter chance. So let's have a look. What letter of the property, the probability line represents the probability the spinner will land on a yellow. So there is one yellow on that spinner. And so therefore it's going to be a quarter chance. So if you have a look at how many notches this number line has, well, we don't count the first one, so we've got one, two, three, four notches. So each one of those notches is going to be a quarter. So one quarter will be at B. Which letter represents probability of landing on a red? So we have two reds there. So that's going to be two quarters. So we've got one quarter and two quarters would be at C. Now two quarters is the same as a half which is what the 0 0.5 there is, it's just a half. What letter on the property line represents the probability it will land on a blue? Well, there aren't any blues on there. So however many times you spin it, it will never land on a blue. And in probability, we mark that with a zero. So it's going to be A. Okay, if you wanna pause the video now and have a go, otherwise, let's get started. So the most important thing with this question is we understand what's going on. So she's costing a trip so she's seeing how much the trip will cost um, now we've got two costs here these three are all the same type of cost they're just fixed however this cost here is going to be per person and they are going to be we are treating them very different the price so she only the only money she's making is the 20 pounds and she sells 100 tickets so uh, what, the most important thing with this question is that you lay out your work now very clearly so that the examiner, the marker, knows exactly what you're doing. So, if I say, uh, first of all, ticket profit, I show the examiner that I'm looking at the profit for each of the tickets sold. So she has 20, uh, she has sells 100 tickets and she makes 20 pounds a ticket. So I want to do 100 times 20, which is going to be 2,000. So she's gonna make 2,000 pounds, okay? Now, if I work out the entrance fee, So all those 100 people are going to have to pay £16 for the entrance fee. Well, we're going to have to pay £16 on their behalf. So it's 100 times 16, which is 1,600. Then if I say other costs, I should say other costs, and it will be 150 for the transport, plus 50 for the food and drink, plus 70 for the other costs. So let's work that out. 150 plus 50 plus 70 is going to be 270. So she's going to make 2,000 pounds, but then she's gonna to have to pay out 1,600 and then another 270 pounds. So 2,000 take away 1,600 take away 270 and that leaves us with 130 pounds so she's going to donate 130 pounds to the school fund okay pause the video now and have a go otherwise let's get started so 70% as a fraction in simplest form 
So percent just means put it over 100. A percentage is always a fraction over 100. Now the first thing I can do is I can divide both top and bottom by 10. That's quite easy on this because I'm just going to remove a 0. So it's just going to be 7 over 10. Then looking at that, there's nothing more I can do because 7 is a prime number and 7 doesn't go into 10. So my answer is going to be 7 over 10. Now the next one, um, they have a decimal fraction and percentage. Now the easiest, I would say, um, to convert these all into to be able to compare them is probably a decimal. You might pick a fraction, you might pick a percentage, but generally I find these easier if they're decimals. So question A, well we don't need to do anything with that. Question B, now you might not know what 3 fifths is as a decimal, but if we times top and bottom by 2, then we get 6 tenths. Now if you remember that that column after the units is the tenth column, so that's going to be 0 0.6 because it's 6 tenths. Last one, to do a percentage to a decimal is nice and easy because you just divide it by 100. So if it's 23, it's just going to be 0 0.23. Now be careful with this because sometimes when people convert 7% into a decimal, they write 0 0.7. Yeah, the 7% would be 0 0.07. Okay, now we just do our little columns to make absolutely sure that we get this right. So, what we got? So, we've got uh, 0.38, we've got 0 0.6, and we've got 0 0.23. So if you look in this column here, because they're both all they're all of them start off with zero, so there's no point looking in that column, we can see that 0.23 is the smallest. So it's going to be 23% is the smallest. And you've got to be careful here because you can't write 0.23 because we've done that. The actual question says 23%. So we've got to make sure we write down what the question says. The reason I'm starting off with the smallest is because it asks for ascending order, which just means from smallest to biggest. The next biggest one, or next smallest one, is the 0 0.38, which was a decimal to start off with. And the biggest one there is that 3 over 5, the 3 fifths. So this question looks quite complicated at first, but actually there are two very simple-ish ways of doing it. We've got two decagons and so that means they are ten-sided and you can just count the sides if you want but you know if it says it's a decagon I trust it it's a decagon. Now what we can do is we could work out the interior angles of the decagons well they'll be the same so I can just work out one and then double it and then take that away from 360 to work out A and that's absolutely fine that'll get you the right answer. A quicker way maybe, and especially on the non-calculator paper, but it works on both papers, is to draw a line up here and realise that you've got two exterior angles there. And the beauty of exterior angles for polygons is they always add up to 360. So to work out the exterior angle, always write down what you're working out, all you need to do is 360 divided by the number of sides the regular polygon has. And they have to be regular, otherwise you can't just divide them because we're assuming they're the same. So that's 36. So if that one's 36 degrees there, and that one's 36 degrees there, then all you need to do is 36 times 2. Well, 6 times 2 is 12, 30 times 2 is 6, so that's going to be 72. So let's show the examiner that. 36 times 2 equals 72 degrees. With any sequence, the first thing to check is whether it goes up by the same amount. Well, looking at this, this goes up by 1, this goes up by 3, so it's not going up by the same amount. This goes up by 4, this goes up by 7. But something you might notice is this goes up by 7, yet there's a 7 here. 
This one goes up by 4, and there's a 4 here. This goes up by 3, and there's a 3 here. This is what we call the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence just starts off with two numbers, and then we add the previous two terms to get to the next term. So we'll add these two together to get to the next one. Then we add these two together to get to the next one. So to find the next one, we need to add the 11 and the 18 together. 18 plus 11 is going to be uh, 29. So the next term is going to be the 29th term. Let's just check that's the sixth term. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So yes, that would be the sixth term would be 29. Then we need to add the 18 and the 29 together. And when the numbers get big, if you don't, if it's not on the calculator paper, you can just add them like this. So 9 plus 8 is 17. Um, and that's going to be 3 plus 1, which is 4. So it's going to be 47. So the seventh term is going to be 47. So always just check that the sequence isn't a Fibonacci sequence um, before you start to panic and think, what is this sequence? Always check for a Fibonacci sequence. It was just, just that the previous two terms are added together to make the next term. With two-way tables, we've got to use the totals to work out the missing numbers. So, a nice place to start is this box here. If we have a look, we've got a total of 46 people who are with brown eyes. 23 of them are female. So all you need to do is 46 and take away the 23, and that leaves 23 left over. Now, let's have a look at a nice easy one. Right, green eyes, that's a nice easy one there. We've got 48 in total um, and 27 females with green eyes. So we want to do 48, take away 27, and that leaves us with 21. Now if we have a look at this one, we have 23 females uh, with, sorry, 23 males with brown eyes, tw uh, 18 males with blue eyes, and 21 males with green eyes. And we assume that there weren't any others because they're not in the table. So we add those together and that gives us 62 in total. And let's have a look at this one maybe. So we've got 62 females all together and we've got 27 of them have green eyes and 23 of them have brown eyes. So we take those 23 and the 27 away from 62 and that leaves us with 12. And we can just check that. We can do 23 plus 12 plus 27 and it equals 62, so we know that's right. With that one sorted, we can get this one. And if there's 18 males with blue eyes and 12 females with blue eyes, that means there's going to be 30 altogether. Now this total is either the total of these ones or the total of these ones, and they should give you the same number. Don't add the blue and the green ones together. So it's only one of them. So 46 plus 30 plus 48 is 124. And let's just check that. 62 plus 62 is also 124. So don't ever write down 248 because that's not correct. So in total, there are 124 people whose eye color were checked. First thing we need to realize with this question is which transformation is it? Well, you have to go through the four transformations. The first one I think of is, it has it rotated, has it spun around? No, it hasn't. Second one, uh, is, it, is there a mirror image of it? No, they both look the same, so it's not, it's not been reflected. Has it grown or shrunk at all? No, so it's not an enlargement. So that leaves transformation. Uh, sorry, translation. <laughs> Translation. Now, translation just means we've moved it, and that's perfect because we have just moved A for, to B. Now, the second thing to realize is we are starting at shape A and we're going to shape B. Now, with translations, to describe them, pick the same point on both shapes. I always pick the top left if it's available. Then, what we want to do is work out how far left or right I have to go from A to get in line with B. And I do this with jumps. And the reason we do this with jumps is I never get the wrong answer when I do jumps. So 1, 
two. I need to go two left. So two left. And let's have a thing. How much up do we have to go? So one jump, two, three, four. So four up. Now the way of showing translations is by using vectors. And it sounds fancy, but it's just putting this information here between a bracket. The number at the top of the bracket is how far right it's gone, and the number at the bottom is how far up it's gone. Well, let's do the number at the bottom first. So translation by, and there's different words you could use there, and at the number at the bottom where it's gone four up. So it's just a four there. Now, here's a problem. This is how far right it's gone, but it's gone two left. Well, we just simply put minus two right. Now, be careful, don't ever put a fraction line between the minus two and four. It's not a fraction, okay? So don't ever put the fraction line in. So we're told one kilogram of cheese costs um, seven pounds 70. How much would 600 grams cost? Well, first of all, I'm going to have um, weight, mass, and price. And I'm just going to sort of split them down the middle. So the weight, well, one kilogram is not going to help us because this one's in grams. So I'm going to convert that to grams. So it's a thousand grams. And I'm going to convert this into pence. So 770 pence. Okay. So I need to get to 600 grams. And so first of all, if I've got a calculator, I can do this a lot easier. But without a calculator, let's try. Well, I can first of all um, divide this by 10 to get it so that it's 100. So that's 100 grams. And that would be 77. And then what I can do is I can times these by 6 to get 600. Okay, so if you've got a calculator, you can just type in. But let's assume that you don't for this question. So we've got 77 times 6, uh, 6 times 7 is 42, add a 0, 6 times 7 is 42, add them together, probably don't need to do this, but anyway, I'll do it anyway, uh, 2, 6, 4, so it's 462 pence, but in pounds, it would be 4 pounds 62, last thing, just check it makes sense, well, we have, we've got about, we've got just over half, so therefore the price is just over half, so it looks good to me. So this question says there's a tennis tournament uh, being played where each player plays each other once. And there's multiple ways of doing this. One of the ways is listing out all the different combinations. But this question only asks for how many tennis matches are being played. So you don't need to list them out, and sometimes you will need to list them out. This one you don't. So let's start off with a liar. A liar has four people that they're going to play against. William, so William, Paul, Samantha and Christine. William, well we've already counted a liar's match with William, so William only has three left that he can play. Then Paul has already, we've already counted his match with the other two, so he's only going to play Samantha and Christine other than his matches we've already counted. Samantha, well, Samantha's only got Christine left to play after we uh, counted all the other matches. And Christine, well, Christine's matches have already been counted so far. So, we've got the four matches Elias going to play, the three matches that William's going to play, not counting the one we've already counted from Elias, plus the two Paul's going to play, plus the other one that Samantha's going to play. So, 4 plus 3 is 7, plus 2 is 9, plus 1 is 10. So, in total, there are 10 different matches going to be played. So, there's a lot of places to start with this question. Whenever I'm given a shape in a question like this, I always ask myself, well, do I need to work out the perimeter of it or the area? And sometimes you're going to have to figure out something else, but it's mainly going to be those two things. Well, this is all about covering the floor. So I'm imagining I'll need to work out the area. 
So I'm going to start off working out the area. Now to do that, I've got to work out what shape it is. Well, it's a trapezium because there's two parallel sides and it's four-sided. So if you've got a pair of parallel sides and it's four-sided, it's a trapezium. So to work out the area, the formula is half A plus B H. Now you need to work out what H and A and B are. A and B are always the ones on the parallel sides. So it's those two. It doesn't matter which way round you call them. H is always the one that connects the two at right angles. So half 2.5 plus 1.5 times 11.5. So I can get my calculator out and I can do 0 0.5 times brackets 2.5 plus 1.5 close brackets times 11.5 and that gives me the answer of 23 so the area of this is 23 meters squared okay so I've, I've managed to work that out let's have a look so tiles are sold in packs 25% off marked price and they're marked at £12. So next thing we can work out is how much they actually cost. And it doesn't matter if you do this in a different order, as long as you do each step and label it well. So um, cost of pack. Okay, so we've got £12, and we need to reduce it by 25%. Okay, so first of all, I need to work out 25% of £12. So the way I can do that is just find a quarter of 12, so divide it by 4, so that's going to be £3. So the cost is going to be £12, take away my £3 discount, which is going to be £9. So the cost of the pack is £9. Okay, so it feels like we're getting somewhere. Now, if each one costs £9, but each one covers 2 metres squared, OK, so we know we've got 23 metres squared to cover. So what I can do is I can work out how many packs I need. So packs needed. So I've got 23 to, uh, metres squared to cover. And each pack covers two. So I do 23 divided by two. Now that gives me the answer of 11.5. So I need 11 and a half packs. Well, unfortunately, shops don't like you taking half a pack. Trust me, I've tried. They really don't like it. So you must always round this up. Otherwise, you won't have enough. If you round it down, say if it came out as 11.4, if you rounded that down, you won't have enough. So there'll be a patch of untiled floor in your kitchen. That's not good. So the answer is going to be 12. So I need 12 packs. So total price. So I need 12 packs, and each of them costs £9. So 12 times 9 is £108. So it's going to cost £108. Now, the last bit of the question, she says she's got £100 to spend. How much extra? So it wants it in pence as well. My goodness. So we need to do uh, extra. And all I'm doing here is doing 108 take away 100, which equals £8, which is 800 pence. Okay, pause the video now if you want to have a go. Otherwise, let's get started. So, uh, first thing in this question is we realize we've got a probability table. And the blue is 0 0.5 chance of happening. The red is 0 0.1 chance of happening. The white is 0 0.1 chance of happening. And the yellow is missing. So, chances are we're going to have to work out the yellow soon. Okay, but we don't at the moment because it says there's 600 counters in the box. So if there's 600 counters in the box and there's a 0 0.5 chance of a blue coming up, then that means, well, 0 0.5 is a half chance. So for there to be a half chance, there needs to be 300 counters. Now, if we were looking for 0 0.1, we would just divide it by 10. Okay, if we were looking for 0 0.2, we would divide it by 10 and double it. Okay, simple as that. 
So work out the probability that the counter will be yellow. Now I know that all probabilities have to add up to one. So the first thing I want to do is just add the probabilities that we've got together. And you don't need to do it like this, but I think it's a little bit easier. So 5, 6, 7. So we've got 0 0.7 so far. And we need to figure out how much more we need to add to 0 0.7 to get to 1. So 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1. So it's going to be 0 0.3. Okay, if you want to pause the video now, please feel free, otherwise let's get started. So, simple solve first, and whenever I have a solve, I always put lines down where the equal sign is, I find it a lot easier. And we are going to first of all expand the brackets, so I'm going to do smiles and rainbows on this, so we end up with 4x minus 40 equals x plus 2. Okay, now notice I've got x on both sides. Okay, now whenever I have x on both sides, I look at the x's and see which one's the smallest. Looking at those, the 1x is the smallest. So I'm going to take away the smallest and I'm going to end up with 3x minus 40 equals 2. Then I'm going to add the 40 to both sides. Okay, because at the moment that 40 is a negative 40. So I do the opposite of that, which is plus 40. I'm slightly running out of room here, so I'm going to put my answer up here. I'm going to do another set of lines. Okay, so we're going to end up with 3x on the left hand side equals and then 2 plus 40 which is 42 okay then I've got this 3 here and that's actually a times 3 so to get rid of it I need to divide both sides by 3 so I'm going to divide the left hand side by 3 and the right hand side by 3 this leaves me with x and now I've got to work out how many 3's in 42 well I know 3 times 10 is 30 and I know 3 times 4 is 12, so the answer is going to be 4, uh, <laughs> it's going to be 14. Okay, I could put that 14 back into the equation up here and check that it works, but probably I don't, I'd do that if I had some time left in the exam. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So I'm going to do the same thing again, put my lines down. Okay, we've got a fraction here. Now, whenever we have fractions, we can't really do anything with this fraction here. Now, all that fraction means is divide the whole left hand side by 3. So, to get rid of it, we just need to times both sides by 3. And that will get rid of the fraction. The top stays the same. We don't times the top by 3. Okay, by timesing it by 3, we've got rid of the bottom, but the top stays the same. And 1 times 3 is 3. Now we've got a tricky one here, we've got a negative y. So I'm going to deal with the 11 first. So I'm going to take away 11 from both sides. And that leaves me with minus y equals 3 take away 11, which is going to be uh, negative 8. Now something I can do here is I can times both sides by minus 1. When I times both sides by minus 1, it gets rid of any negatives. Well, it switches the signs. So if I had an 8 on the right, it would turn into a minus 8. But they're both negative, so it's just y equals 8. So my answer to that is y equals 8. Now what I could have done at this stage here is I could have added the y to both sides and then taken away the 3, and that would leave me 8 equals y which is the same as y equals 8. It's just a matter of preference which one you choose to do in the exam. So inequalities, what are they? They just mean instead of x equaling something, x is greater than or smaller than something. So x can normally have lots of different values. 
Now, this statement here is really important. Integer just means a whole number. So we know that x can't be a half, because that's not a whole number. Now, x says here x is greater than minus 7 and is less than or equal to 3. So when it asks you to write down all the numbers that that's true for, well, let's have a think. Well, if it's less than, sorry, if it's greater than minus 7, then it can't be minus 7. It can't be equal to it. So it's going to be minus 6, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now let's have a look at the other one. It says x can be less than or equal to 3. So that line there, if you look at it, that little line there, so if I do it a little bit bigger, the line that I've just drawn there says it can be 3. So we must include 3 in our answer. And that's how you get full marks. Now you probably will get one mark if you forget to put the 3 down or you put the minus 7 accidentally. Right, the next one I'm just going to write out a little bit bigger. Now the way we do this question is the same way as solving just a normal equation with an equals, but don't ever put an equals. There was an exam um, a few years ago that if you wrote an equals in it, they would give you zero marks. So the first step is to expand the brackets. So I do smiles and rainbows, but if you've got another method, that's fine. I'll put a little line there to remind me to times it. So five times three X is 15 X. And five times minus five is minus 25. Now, that you could have divided both sides by 5, and that would have been fine. Um, next step is to get rid of this minus 25. And you must start with that. You can't get rid of the 15 first. So we're going to add 25 to both sides to get rid of that minus 25. So we're left with 15x on this side. And 35 plus 25 will be, well, 5 plus 35 is 40. 40 plus 20 is 60. Now, to get rid of this times 15, we need to divide both sides by 15. So that will get rid of the 15 there. And how many 15s in 60? Well, 2 times 15 is 30, so it would be 4. Now, be really careful not to accidentally put any equal signs in your answer, and especially this bit here. So to, it's x is greater than 4. With stem and leaves, the tens, and sometimes the units, but mainly the tens, are in this column. And then the units go in this bit here. So, first of all, I'm going to pick the smallest number. And it's easier to do this by doing it smallest to biggest. Because the units here must be in order of size. Now, the order goes, the smallest go on the left-hand side, and the biggest on the right-hand side. However, if you're doing a stem leaf over here, the biggest go on the right hand side, sorry, the smallest go on the right hand side and the biggest go on the left hand side. Basically, the smallest must be as close to the middle and the biggest must be away from the middle. Okay, so the smallest one we've got is 30. So we're going to do 30 first. Now we've got the 3 already, so we're just going to put a 0 there and that represents 30. Then the next smallest, I think, is 33. So the 3 goes there. Uh, I think the next smallest is 39. So the 9 goes there. OK, and that's the 30s done. So let's move on to 40s. 41 goes there. 43 goes there. 44. 48. And the last, uh, last few, so 52 and 52, well, they're the same. So they can be next to each other. And 64. So the smallest go on the left, and then you get bigger as you go to the right. And that's really important because you need to do that to get the right marks, or to get the right correct answer. Okay, the last thing to do is the key. Now the key is just pick a value, any value. I always pick the one at the top left, but it can be any value. It doesn't even have to be a value on there. And you do 3 line 0, which I've just copied the bit I've done in the yellow. 
mean 30. Now you might ask, why do we need that? Because it's always going to be 30. Well, not quite, because you can get ones that are four line one means 4.1, which is why these ones here aren't always going to be tens. Sometimes those will be units and you'll be writing down the decimals. So just look out for that. Now you need to have, first of all, all the numbers in the stem and leaf, secondly, them in order, and thirdly, the key. That's what the mark scheme is going to say. Okay, so we've got a scatter graph question, and the first question asks us just to plot the information from the table into the scatter graph. So we've got ice cream sales at the top and temperature at the bottom, which is not kind of the same way around as on the graph, so we've just got to be careful. So the ice cream sales are 46, which is here on the scale, and the temperature is 31, which is here on the scale. And just check that you're you're looking at the scale correctly. So we're looking about, let's have a look, about here. Okay, next one, ice cream sales 40, which is here on the scale, and uh, temperature 34, which is here. So we've just got to be careful, and it's about there. So those are the two plots that we want to take. Next question says, on another day, um, ha another day had an average temperature of 45 degrees. Use the scatter graph to estimate the sales of the day. Now, you need to get used to just drawing a line of best fit to any scatter graph that you come across. You will have to do it. Okay, so just do it. Just even if it doesn't ask you to, just draw a line of best fit. Now, a line of best fit is just a line that follows all the data like that. You should have roughly the same amount of data top and bottom, but it doesn't matter if it's not perfect, okay? So, let's have a look. So we've got average temperature of 45 degrees. So we're going to draw a line up from 45 degrees, which is about there. And we're going to draw... Oh, the line didn't come up. So let's draw that line there. It's refusing to come up for some reason. Uh, let's try another one. There we go. Let's try another line. Uh, okay, let's do it the old fashioned way. Okay, and then we draw a line across from where it's the line of best fit. Now, to me, that looks like about 55. But if you had the same question and you came up with a different answer of 54 or 58, it still can be correct because you might have drawn a slightly different line of best fit. Okay, so don't worry if you sit and uh, sit down next to someone and do the same question and get a slightly different answer. Just draw the lines, straight lines, unlike mine, onto your diagram to show the examiner that you um, worked it out. So we've got 55 sales we're predicting. Now, what do we notice about this? Well, look at where all the data is. All the data is here, and yet we're estimating outside the range of the data. Okay, it's called extrapolation, where you do that. So the problem with that, if you imagine we do a graph of height against age, so we have age at the bottom and height up the side, then when you're very young, you grow quite quickly. If someone extrapolated your data and said, oh, okay, well, that growth is going to continue. When you're 80 years old, you're going to be 20 foot high. Well, that doesn't make much sense. It's because we're quite confident with down here because we've got data for that, but we're not very confident with this bit here. We don't know whether the trend continues. Now, with ice cream sales, if it's ridiculously hot, no one's going to leave their house. They're all going to be sitting inside with their air conditioning or sitting in their car with their air conditioning. So we know it probably won't continue. So if you just say that the, um, the estimate is outside the range of the data and if you want to really impress the examiner then you can use the word extrapolated it's been extrapolated okay if you want to pause the video now and have a go otherwise let's get started 
Now the main equation to realize for this is y equals m x plus c. Now m and c are both values you're trying to find out. m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept. So let's have a look at what c is first because it's normally the easiest. C is just the point that the line hits the y-axis. So C is just 5. To find M is a little bit harder. M is called the gradient, and it's how steep the line is. So if I pick where it hits the y-axis, although you can pick any point, and I go across from there, 1 square, and I go up, the gradient is for every 1 we go across, how far do we have to go up? 2. So the gradient is 2. So we've got y equals 2x plus 5. And that's our answer. Now if you've got a line going downwards, the gradient, which is this one here, will be a negative. And sometimes it goes up 1. So you might get y equals 1x. Well, you would write y equals x. If it goes down one for every one it goes across, then it will be minus x. Okay, so for advanced mean questions, and I mean the average mean, not just difficult questions, it pays to know that actually the mean is a type of triangle, just like speed, distance, time, and density, and all those ones. So we work out the mean by doing the sum that just means add the numbers together over the amount of numbers. Now the reason it's helpful to know this as a triangle is sometimes in the advanced questions they will give you the mean and the amount or the mean and the sum and they'll ask you for something else. They might ask you for the amount or the sum. So with that in mind we can work out the total or the sum of the boys. So the mean of the boys is 11, and the uh, amount of the boys is 15. So we just using the triangle, we just times them together, and we can work out what the sum is, or total is. So 10 times 15 is 150, add another 15, 165. Then we can work out the total of children. Same process. The mean of the children is 17, and the amount of children was 15 boys, 20 uh, sorry, 10 girls, so that's 25. And I can just do a grid. If you've got a calculator, then obviously you can use a calculator. So that's 200, 14 with a zero, 50. And 35. So let's add those together 200, 140, 50, 35, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 4. So 425. So the total of the children is 425, the total of the boys is 165. So therefore, the total of the girls is the total total, take away the boys total. So 425, take away 165. So that's going to be 0, I'm going to have to borrow one off that, so that's 6, 2. That's 260. So all the girls added together is 260. But it's asked for the mean number of coins for the girls. So mean of girls. And we just use the standard sum over amount. So we know that they add up to 260. And we know that there are 10 girls in total. So that's going to be 26.
Okay, for Venn diagrams, it's really important to understand the notation. This symbol here means union. It just means or. It means it can be in A, or it can be in B, or it can be in both. So it's any number inside either circle. So I could have 9, 5, 3, 7, 18, or 2. Let's go for 9. But the other 5 would be correct. This symbol here... I always view it as an AND. I always put a little line there to say A for AND. And it means it needs to be in A and B. It can't just be in A, it can't just be in B. It needs to be in both. And there's two numbers that uh, fit that bill, 3 and 7. So I could write 3 or I could write 7. Now this little symbol here, okay, and it's an A with a dash. That dash there means not. So we're looking for numbers that aren't in A and are in B. Well, let's have a look at where not A is. Well, it's anywhere around here. Anywhere around here is not in A. And let's have a look at where B is. So B is anywhere here. So the numbers that overlap both of those are the 18 and the 2. So it's 18 and 2. So there are two numbers that fit that bill. So that will go at the top of our fraction. And there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in total. Now I can simplify that a little bit to make it a quarter. And so my answer to that will be 1 over 4, or a quarter. OK, so the first thing to realise is that these two angles here are exactly the same because they're corresponding angles. So if they're the same, we can just get them equal to each other. So 2y minus 50 equals 54. I'm going to try and solve this, so I'm going to put my lines down. Now, first thing to do is add 50 both sides. So I get the 2y on its own. So 2y equals 104. Then I'm going to divide both sides by 2, so I just get y equals y equals 52. Okay, so we know y equals 52, so this y here is going to be 52 degrees. Okay, second thing we know is that this angle here and this angle here are equal because of alternate angles, so that's going to be 54 degrees. So the next bit of working out to do is to find out what x is. Well, We've got a triangle here, so we know that x is going to be x equals 180, take away the 52 that we found out, plus the 54 that we found out. So that's going to be 180, take away 106. And that's going to be 180 take away 100, which is 80, and take away 6 is 74 degrees. So the answer is 74 degrees. Now, with these questions, you'll be expected to write down y on each step. So at the first stage here, I will write corresponding. Um, when I've highlighted that equals 54, I will say alternate. And it's also opposite to 2y minus 50, so I could have worked it out that way. And then finally, at this bit, I would say angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. OK, pause the video now and have a go. Otherwise, let's get started. Now, there's a real key word in this question, and that word is estimate. Anytime you get the word estimate or estimation, you know you're not working out the exact answer. So the first thing I need to do is go through the values and and figure out a uh, estimate for them. It's normally one significant figure. So first of all, I'm going to start with pi. Now pi is the same as 3.14 blah blah blah. Goes on forever. So I'm going to estimate that to be say three. It's always one significant figure, and so three would be a good estimate. The radius it says is exactly 3.11. But I'm going to estimate that to be 3. Now I could estimate 4 over 3 
uh, to be roughly one and that would be absolutely fine I'm not going to though um, so volume equals 4 over 3 times pi which we're estimating to be 3 times r cubed which I'm estimating to be 3 cubed so you can see straight away that I can just cancel the threes there okay and you could have worked this out by three times three cubed and then divided by three but I might as well just cancel them now times and three cubed is three times three which is nine times three which is twenty seven so when you times something by four you double it and then double it again or I could just do a quick grid or I can do a long multiplication four times seven is twenty eight 4 times 8, so it's 108. Now, you shouldn't really have to do this bit here when you're doing an estimation, but sometimes it's just to make sure you get the right answer. So I could have just doubled it and doubled it again, but I'm positive I've got the right answer now. Now, um, it's common uh, for um, an estimation question now to get a second part which gets you to describe your answer whether it's an underestimate or an overestimate. Well, let's have a think about what we did with the values. We rounded pi up, or oh, down I mean, because it was 3.14 and we rounded it to 3. We rounded r down. So therefore, volume is an underestimate. So in your answer, just say, say whether you rounded the figures up or down. And be careful, because if they're at the bottom of a fraction, then it works the other way. So if you round them up, uh, if, sorry, if you round them down, it will become an overestimate. So just be a little bit careful with that. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you found it useful and enjoyable. Um, don't forget to go on to the onmaths.com website for this paper and a whole load of other stuff. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please click like. If you want to see more from us, especially paper three, which we're looking at hopefully getting out um, as quickly as we can after Thursday, um, then subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.